pawn balls tell me what to do. Here we go. To make all my locker late dreams come true. Hello everybody, Bob loves the pawn balls coming at you live from Pecan Plantation below Lake Granberry. I see Steve I see Steve Scanlon. Hey, you guys know the drill. Pawn boss magazine hashtag palm boss magazine in the comments section click like share this to your uh timeline and you're eligible for a drawing for a palm boss hat there it is right there a real one and a palm boss mug and i'm embarrassed that i don't have one that knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold now we don't know how it knows but he never called me back i left my number three times i'm not sure it was really his his phone number but i tried it anyway Somewhere in Tennessee, it was at least a Tennessee area code. So, I got a whole bunch of stuff to talk to y'all about tonight. So, you know what I do here? I got to find it and get it up so I can see y'all's questions and stuff. Debbie's about to come through the door. All right, I just clicked on watch the live video. Ooh, now I got to turn off the sound so it doesn't blow us all up. Okay, now then, okay. Holy cow, let's see what everybody's saying. John Funk, Jason Nipstad. John Funk's always, if, if Jason's not first up, John Funk's first up from mid-Michigan. Jason's from Fayetteville, North Carolina. John says it's a bit choppy, but hope it will be good enough to keep up with you. I hope it'll be good, up, good enough to keep up with me, too. I see R.E. Thompson checking in from Mississippi. Robert McDonald, Troy Todd. Glad you guys are checking in here. Drew Bachman checking in from North Carolina. We got... Two Cacalacs checking in. That's great. I love it. So you guys bring your questions. And, uh-oh, girlfriend's over there. She's at the door. What's the matter, girlfriend? It's okay. Come here. It's okay. She's about to come through the door. So, um, I want to tell you all several things. Hey, be sure and tune in next Wednesday. I got. Do I have a really cool thing going on for you guys next Wednesday? Listen to this. We're going to be doing a live broadcast from the side of a lake, a lakeside in Whit, Texas, out west of Dallas, Fort Worth. And there's memes. Hi, baby. Hi, honey. I'm going live right here. She gave me the thumbs up, so that must be a good thing. So anyway, we're going to be doing a broadcast. Our next Wednesday is going to be from the Barrett Ranch over uh, west of uh, Fort Worth, near Mineral Wells in Palapena County, near Whit, Texas. Now, here's the cool thing about this. Um, I started hearing from John Barrett, I don't know, six weeks ago or so. He started asking a few questions and, and trying to help him with aquatic plants and talking about how we can uh, you know, judge water clarity, all the things we're looking at this time of year to make sure your lake is working just like you want it to. And so as, as John kept asking questions, I thought, you know what, it would be good to have a conversation with him. So we talked on the telephone for a little bit. And I was intrigued with his personality, with his level of enthusiasm, with his folks' lake. His parents have got about a 19-acre lake over there on the ranch. So I'm going to tell you more about that here in a minute. I want to uh, say hello to some people here. Let's see here. I'm going to scroll back down. R.E. Thompson is live. Glad to see you, R.E. Holy cow, I can't believe you've got time to watch this. Now, everybody that doesn't know R.E. Thompson, this guy is a, uh, a man of faith. A man that loves God, he loves to fish, he helps people, he works with uh, with his church. He's in his 80s. I'm pretty sure he's going to make it to 110. Pretty sure. Michael Eric checking in from Iowa. Harrison Davis. Hey, Mr. Palm Boss, you've been slammed at work. The reason for my MIA. Well, Harrison, I'm glad you're here today. Checking in all the way from Georgia. Chris Arthur, good to see you. Steve Hawkins from New York. Elmo Jim Liner, say hello to Gene. Hello, Gene. What's Gene? How are you hanging out with Gene today, Jim? How'd that work out? Good gosh. I need to catch up with Gene. Hey, there's Trevor. I got to meet Trevor today. Told him about this show, and here he is. He's looking at it. He's working on our house over there. I tell you what, I'm really impressed with the guys that are working on our house. I'm hoping we can be moved into it by the end of August, 1st September, but in the meantime, we're going to be hanging out right here. Look at there, Devin Thompson's over in Hawaii. It's five hours earlier there than it is here. He kind of interrupted his lunch so he could come hang out with us. Blair Ulrich, Bob Meyer. 
So anyway, going back to uh, to John Barrett, as we got talking, he was telling me about some aquatic plant issues and that they'd renovated the lake. They, you know, that they'd wrote known it and started over and restocked it two years ago. And he came up with a great idea. I love this idea. He says, you know what? Why don't we come on over to, uh, you come to the ranch. We'll broadcast live. My parents love to host people. And we'll do some things live. We'll do, we'll look at Sechi disc. We'll check water temperatures. We'll identify plants. And he was even so bold as to say that he would catch a few fish and we could look at them live. And then I could tell you my thoughts about those fish. You know, what kind of shape they're in. How do their gills look? Let's talk about their color. You know, so I don't want to put any pressure on John Barrett. Uh, yeah, I do. I want to put pressure on John Barrett. John, you got to catch some fish, dude. Now, I don't know that he's watching the show tonight because he's babysitting three little ones because his, his wife works at Cook's Children's Hospital as a nurse. And she's in a COVID unit over there taking care of youngsters. So, uh, I don't know if he's going to get to check in, but I got a feeling he'll watch it later. Anyway. So now here's the cool, here's a, not only is, is he cool and energetic and excited, but his mother is, Josie, are you listening? I can't tell. Josie usually, lately she's kind of been watching on the, on the big screen TV in their house that they've got up for sale down in Round Rock. But his mother, John Barrett's mother, listen, anybody got drums, do a little drum roll here, is Miss America. Yeah. So guess what? We're going to have Miss America on this show next Wednesday night. So we're going to ask her what she thinks about ponds and lakes and fish. And I can't wait to hear what she says. And the Queen will be with me too. Debbie will be out there hanging out. So I cannot wait to get Miss America, Shirley Cothran Barrett, Dr. Shirley Cothran Barrett, by the way, on this show with us to talk about what the ponds mean and the lakes and just kind of get her take. And her husband. I want to meet the guy that married Miss America. I think they might have been high school sweethearts in Denton, Texas way back in the 70s. So uh, I can't wait to hear their story. And uh, they begat John. So John's begat several little ones. His wife is off next Wednesday, so he's going to get to hang out. So we're going to talk about their lake, talk about what uh, everybody thinks about it, the value of the lake. You know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see the perspectives of what dad thinks and what mom thinks and then what John thinks about the lake. And I can't wait to do that. Plus, we're going to do some real hands-on pond management. So, tell your friends, Miss America is going to be hanging out with the pond boss. Honey, you okay with that? She's yeah. a, she, <laughs> she said sure. She'll be there too. Won't you? Sure. Sure, she'll be there. All right. So let's see here, Ron Perello from Virginia. We got a great diverse audience tonight. We have uh, 34 people on now, looks like. Tommy Welsh, John, let's see, John Henry. Tommy Welsh says, I have a two acre pond. I stock 500 pounds of channel catfish and 1,000 pounds of flathead catfish in my pond. Is that too many? If so, how many should I remove? Well, it looks like somebody's already kind of given the great big, oh my gosh, look on there. Billy Miller did. Travis Paul Smith. Palm, you know, hey, hashtag Palm Oz Magazine, click like, um, share this on your timeline, and you're all eligible for a drawing for a Palm Oz hat and a Palm Oz mug that knows how to say it, Jacob. Yep, how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. We don't know how it knows, but it knows. I'm going to answer that question for you here in just a minute there, Tommy Wells, because I've got a feeling that inquiring minds are real interested to know the thoughts about that. Travis Ball is telling you hello, honey. David Schneiderman, he knows the drill. All right, so let me tell you this. I got a question, Tommy Welsh. Where, okay, I'm going to call you out, which I don't do this very often, but I'm doing it now. Where did you get 1,000 pounds of flathead catfish? You didn't buy them from a fish farm. You, uh, if you caught them, how many fish is that? Is that 10 fish? Is it 200 fish? Two acre pond. Let me tell you this: it's if you did in fact stock a thousand pounds of flathead catfish, I am thrilled that you stocked those five hundred pounds of channel catfish because that will be the food for those flatheads. We don't want flathead catfish in a pond two two acres or two hundred acres. They don't fit. So, Kendall Brown checking in from Caldwell, Texas. So let me go circle back on that, um, Tommy. 
There's part of me that wants to not believe that, but I will never say that to anybody. So I'm going to scratch that thought, and I'm going to say that you put in 500 pounds of channel catfish, and where did you get 1,000 pounds of flatheads, and how much did you pay for them? So answer those questions for me. And that's how I'm going to call you out. Oh, wait. No, I'm not going to call you out. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Two-acre pond, if you did, in fact, stock those fish, drain the pond, take all the fish out, skin them, and eat them, and don't ever do that again. Jared Poole, Hill Country Hammer. Jared was on my show back a few months ago. We went up uh, to uh, fish with him a little bit. Kind of got cold that day. <coughs> if you want to catch a double-digit bass, uh, Jared Poole's a great guy to talk to. Check him out. Um, I got a great phone call today from Jim Allen. It was pretty interesting. Jim Allen, <coughs> when I saw the uh, area code, I knew that he was from Rochester, New York, but he was talking about a lake outside of Louisville, Kentucky. So he and I, he and I had about a 20-minute conversation today that was really energetic and fun, and I thought I'd share some of that with you. So uh, bring your questions. I'll keep looking down here at my laptop. You all know how I play this game. I look at the laptop for questions. But I do want to tell you about that conversation today. So Jim Allen lives on an 80-acre lake. It's a club lake. And he says there's at least, I think he said, 300 members of that club lake. And his question to me was, how do I stop feeding the fish? And he had called the Purina hotline today. And uh, he asked them, and they said they didn't know, so they had him call me. So his question was, I've been feeding the fish, and I want to stop. I want to stop feeding the fish. Tommy said he got them from a fish hatchery. Okay, well, here's my answer. Drain the pond, take them all out, because I don't know how you're going to feed 1,000 pounds of flatheads and how you're going to feed, paid 435 a pound. Okay, I don't know how you're going to feed. A, now, maybe you're saying fathead minnows, and I'm reading it flathead catfish. A thousand pounds of flathead catfish, they won't eat fish food. The channel catfish will eat fish food. How big are those flathead catfish, Tommy? I'm going to stay with this. I'm going to stay with you, buddy. You Hang out here. Tell me, tell me, Tommy, how big are those fish? How big are the flatheads? Because I haven't, I, this is my 41st year of doing this, and I'm, I always learn something new, and I'm learning something right now. Tell me which hatchery you were, where you bought them, and how big they were, because I want to contact that fish hatchery and find out just how in the world they propagate flathead catfish and who they sell them to, because I'm really interested in that. I know there's some public reservoirs that could use a few of those and eat all the dadgum extra stuff. Six to 40 pounds a piece, he says. Okay, um, send me, private message me and tell me which fish hatchery, give me their phone number. I want to call them and talk to them about that. I think that's cool as heck. But here's my answer to you. I would harvest as many of those flatheads as you can because a 40 pound flathead catfish will eat the biggest channel catfish that you put in there. Even if you put in, even if you put in some 10 to 12 pound cat, channel catfish, those 40 pound flatheads will eat them. So that will be their food. Now you can feed the channel catfish Purina is game fish chow, feed them Aquamax MVP, you can feed them any of the commercial fish foods and those channel cat are going to eat those fish foods as the flatheads eat your channel cat. So, there's my answer, and I'm not trying to be cute. I'm just telling you the way I see it. The way I see it is a two-pound, uh, oh, oh, so, oh, here's something else. Those 1,000 pounds of flatheads that you eat, that 40-pound flathead will eat that 6-pound flathead. So your flathead catfish numbers will go down because the biggest ones will eat those smallest ones because they are the most, they will be the premier predator fish in that system. So... They net them from the river. Okay. All right, look at there. Wyatt is checking in. Conniger from uh, Lake McConaughey in Nebraska. That's cool. That's one of Bruce Condello's stomping grounds. He loves to go there. So, Tommy, send me the name of that fish hatchery and their phone number. I want to ring them tomorrow and see what they can do. All right, so I want to go back to Jim Allen. His question to me was, how do I stop feeding fish? Girlfriend, what? Come here. Come here. Kind of interrupting this broadcast. Oh, ooh. hey, tell everybody hello. Okay, there you go. All right, that's good. Now go. 
Okay, Matt Marsden checking in from Signal Mountain, Tennessee. All the best. Thanks, man. Uh, Mike McPherson, uh, Mike, Matt Marsden, check him out. Friend him on Facebook, see what he does. He manufactures some, uh, uh, manufactures some American fish trees, fish habitat. When adding well water during the dry part of the summer here in Indiana, do I need to add anything to keep my phosphate level from getting way out of control? Is there anything else I should worry about? You know what, Mike? Do the, um, do the, uh, check your water chemistry and see if there's any phosphate in it. If there's phosphate in it, then let's have another conversation. A lot of times, depending on your well water, how deep it is, how deep it is, then there's just, um, there's really not much phosphate to worry about depending on which aquifer you're in. Okay, now I want to go back to Jim Allen. 80 Acre Lake, he says, so how do I stop feeding the fish? So my question was, why? Why would you, that's my favorite question. If I'm hanging out with you and we start talking about your lake, it's one of the questions I'm going to ask you at some point is going to be why. Why are you doing that? Why are you thinking that? And it's not, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. I'm just trying to find out what in the world it is. You know, so um, I want to. I want to know. I, I'm just. I'm curious. Like I want Tommy Welsh to tell me about those fish. He's gonna call me tomorrow. All right. Uh, call me if I miss you. Just leave a message. I'll call you back, man. Yeah, girlfriend is pretty pretty. Travis, pretty pretty. That's redundant. Girlfriend, is she not letting you in there to play with you? She's driving. Oh, there she goes. Now she's gonna go hang out with Mama. So Jim says. So my question was, why do you want to stop feeding the fish? So he says, well, part of the problem is in their 80-acre lake, they've been blessed with an overabundance of gizzard shad, and the bass can't keep up with them. So each year, uh, the state surveyed their lake, the state of um, Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky, came in and said, you don't have enough bass. So they've been buying bass. They've been buying feed train largemouth bass. And he's a little bit worried that he's feeding the fish off the dock and the bass are eating his fish food, where he really wants to kind of gear them up to go eat the gizzard shad. And he's seeing big schools of the gizzard shad and they're worried that they have too many shad and that the shad are competing with bluegill, red ear sunfish, native species of sunfish, competing for space and competing in the food chain and that they aren't able to uh, grow the numbers of bass that they need. So when he said that, the first thing that hit me is, is there any bass recruitment? So are they able to, are the bass spawning? So I asked him, Sounds to me like the bass aren't spawning. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're seeing clouds of baby bass. Okay, so if the bass are spawning, they should be replenishing themselves. The second thing is, is what kind of feed are you feeding? He says, I am feeding Aquamax MVP. He says, I tried a, 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 a cheap bag of grain-based fish food, 15 bucks a bag, and the fish wouldn't even eat it. So I switched. He says, it's amazing the difference. He said, the guy that I bought the feed train bass from told me which fish to use, he said, so I went and started with Aquamax 600, then I switched over to Aquamax MVP, he says, and they just wipe it out. So I said, okay, well, you're at, you got an 80 acre lake, so um, have you, uh, uh, I, I mean, how long does it take you to go through a bag of fish food? On an 80 acre lake, it would take about a bag, I tell you what, it would take almost two bags of fish food per day per day. 100 pounds of fish food per day to be significant on interfering with the natural food chain in that lake. So he said he feeds a, maybe a quart and a half to two quarts. A 50 pound bag of fish food lasts for one month. So what I told him was that what he's doing is irrelevant to interfere with the feed train bass from feeding on the shad. Now here's where it gets really interesting, folks. Feed train largemouth bass, when they're first started, they're trained to feed. When they get a little bigger, they eat fish food. When they go to the hatchery ponds, guess what they eat? Fish food. As they grow to a pound to a pound and a quarter, guess how they got there? Fish food. Even though it's instinctive for those bass to be predators, they haven't been. So when that those fish that are a pound and a quarter, pound and a half, pound, where they are, are brought and stocked into that 80 acre lake, they don't know how to go eat shad. They do know how to eat that fish food. 
But the amount of fish food that he's feeding is also feeding bluegills, some feed trained bass, probably some of those shad, carp, if there are any carp. So there's, there's, there's a variety of fish that are coming to eat that fish food, is which makes it insignificant to interfere with those largemouth bass that are feed trained. So the bottom line, and plus, 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 if there's 500 pounds of feed trained bass, they eat 3% of their body weight every day, so they're going to have to eat at least 15 pounds of something every day just to keep up. You know, and if he's feeding a pound and a half or two pounds of fish food every day, there's no way that's enough. So those fish have got to go fend for themselves or they're going to decline. So my, my advice to him was that he should be uh, continue the feeding because the main reason he started feeding the fish was to attract enough fish to the dock so the little kids around the, the, the club can catch a few fish. So I said, you know, don't don't stop. Just keep doing that. You're spending 40 bucks a month for nine months out of the year. Keep feeding the fish. But one thing I'd consider is not to buy any feed trained bass. If if your bass aren't recruiting well, so if that's if those those clouds of little bass that you're seeing are not surviving up to be big enough to eat those little shad as they're being hatched, there's another problem. And you got to figure that out. So I suggested uh, they said that the, he said that the state comes in and analyzes that fishery once a year. So I suggested he get in touch with Jones Fish Farm up there in Cincinnati, get some counsel from them because it's not the fish food that's causing the issue if the gizzard shad are getting too big. Now <clears throat> here's where it gets kind of fun, and this is how it affects you guys. You need to know all these different species of fish and their life cycles and their lifestyles. What that means is, is I asked him, I said, uh, I said, Jim, do you know why they call a gizzard shad a gizzard shad? He said, uh, because they have a gizzard. I said, bam, bingo, that's right, they do. They have a, they have a gizzard. Well, what that means is when a gizzard shad is first hatched, they run around in, in clouds, schools of little bitty fish, gleaning their food from the water column. But once they get to be five or six inches, then the schools by that time have begun to break up. Fish of similar sizes go in similar directions. They start feeding in the mud. So those fish are going into shallow water, rooting around in the mud, gleaning their food from the mud at that point. So they're living in a different niche. Now they do compete with bluegill, they do compete with shell crackers, they compete with bass, but they grow so fast that they can take up a lot more space than what we might have allotted to them in a lake, which can interfere with growth rates of the other fish. So it's, it, it is going to be important to have enough large bass that are predator fish to get those uh, gizzard shad numbers under control. Now what I didn't talk to Jim about today was there are other alternative methods. It takes a, a, a smaller amount of rope known to kill gizzard shad as it does other species of fish. There have been a number of times that, especially in my younger days when I was more energetic about it than now, is to go out and uh, use just that right amount of rope known to put it in at just the level to kill some gizzard shad, get their numbers down. If you can reduce their numbers, then at that point it gives the, the, the game fish a more of an advantage to be able to go feed on them and feed on the younger bluegills and all that sort of thing. I see James Allen checking in. There he is right there. You guys see him right there. So um, so that's my take on that. Uh, stopping feeding is irrelevant. I would keep feeding just because it brings fish in for the kids to catch. If you, if you, uh, I'm going to keep going down there and look back at this in a minute. So uh, uh, if you want to manage the gizzard shad, there's several ways to skin that cat. One is to do a partial fish kill. But you need to work with somebody that knows what they're doing and get ready to write a check. The other part is to manage for predator fish. I'll tell you something we did not talk about, Jim, is tiger muskies. Tiger muskies are a really, really good choice up in the Louisville, Kentucky area. You could probably get some of those from Jones Fish Farm. Check that out. Tiger muskies, 13, 14, 15 inches long, can grow to 40 inches long. You don't need that many in an 80-acre lake if you stocked 100 now they're, they're like 15 bucks an inch or something ridiculously high. 
you know, they're 40 or 50 bucks a piece, but if you can stock 50 to 100 of them, they could help you manage those gizzard shad. And, and it would add a fish to add to the diversity of the fishing. So think about that. Dave Weber, I think I'll have a nominee for the You Don't Know What, You Don't Know Award. There you go. That's it. Dave, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm sitting right on top of that list, buddy. I don't know what I don't know. None of us do. So Travis Smith says, have you heard from Fletcher Cox? Anything done to his pond yet? Yeah, that's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty interesting. He was, he was surprised, as was I, because here's the way it went out with Fletcher Cox. I didn't know who he was. I told you guys this several weeks ago on my show because uh, I've kind of not watched the NFL a whole lot. I watch a few games. I've just kind of gotten lost with their politics. You know, they're out there to entertain, and if I'm not entertained, I don't want to see it. You know, so I got a little bit disenchanted with their politics, so I kind of zeroed in on college sports more than anything. So I'm a little embarrassed that I did not know who Fletcher Cox was, but when I met him and talked to him, I thought, good gosh, this guy must be an athlete, and he's wearing Philadelphia Eagles warm-up clothes. That should have been something to trigger me. And, you know, 99 times out of 100, before I go meet with somebody, I look them up online so I can see who they are and be prepared. Well, I'd gotten so busy with trying to move the RV and do what I do and, you know, handle all my consulting work. I just didn't do it. So I was a little embarrassed. So I came back and uh, proposed the idea to Fletcher that we go and analyze his big lake and then check out his small pond to see what's in there before we stocked any fish. He wasn't interested in doing that. He would rather spend that, we were gonna charge him 1,500 bucks to go check out the fishery and see what he had, but he decided he wanted to spend that money on fish. So I did something I don't do very often, I passed him off. Because I wanna work with people that are interested in managing their lakes and doing it in a way that I see that could be successful. Now I'm not saying he won't be successful because he can certainly go buy some fish, put them in the small ponds, and accomplish his goals. But that's not what I do. So I turned him over to American Sport Fish Hatchery. I know they took him a bunch of fish last week. I'm sure they got him some feed trained bass and some big bluegills, probably some catfish. I don't know what else they did, but I don't know. I don't know what I don't know. There we go. I, about, I love it. <coughs> okay, let's see here. Travis says, uh, eight acres, I feed 150 pounds a month. Yep, well, Travis is in a pretty big hurry to get his fish to grow, and that's pretty adequate there. Eight acres, 150 pounds a month. Now, Travis, hey, kids, listen to me. Listen to me. I'm talking to you. Listen to me. In the next article of Pond Boss, you guys know Chuck Brinkman that comes on this show. He narrowly averted a crisis because he's doing exactly what Travis is doing. Well, I got paused there for a minute. I hope y'all hung in there with me. So, I lost track of what I was saying, so let me go back to these questions and we'll keep going. Oh my gosh, I'm going down here. Okay, here we go. Oh, 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 I know what I was saying. Travis, you guys, if you don't subscribe to Palm Boss, you guys need to do that. Hey, 35 bucks a year, cheaper than a Friday night date. When we finish here, Debbie and I are going to go down to the 19th hole here at Pecan Plantation, eat a little supper, have a little wine or something. I'll spend more than 35 bucks. I know that. So, you guys, subscribe to Palm Boss. I promise you, you get a nugget. Now, out of this next issue, especially for Travis, there's an article in there about Chuck Brinkman, who's on this show almost every Wednesday night, and how he averted a major fish kill. And he was doing pretty much the same thing Travis is doing, with a much smaller body of water, by the way. So Harrison says, how difficult is it to plant aquatic plants yourself along the shoreline, hold soil in place and prevent erosion with little experience? It's easy to do that if you pick the right plants and protect them, give them a chance to establish. That's the hard part. You, uh, If you've got something that wants to chew up plants like turtles, uh, ducks, things like that, you gotta put a little protective fence around them so they can get established. Once they get established, they'll take off. All right, Jim, good to see you. Thank you very much, Trevor. What do big bass do in a river like the Brazos when it floods? They go to where they're safe. Actually, they avoid the current. They go into areas where there are eddies, where the water is swirling around and not moving so much, and they hunker close to structure. They typically don't go upstream, don't go downstream. Once they're, once they're fitted into a, to a habitat they're comfortable in, where there's enough food and they're safe, 
they won't leave. And just because the river's really rolling like the Brazos has been doing the last six weeks doesn't mean they're going to leave. Now what will happen is some fish will move upstream. So if a bass, a large amount of bass, isn't content where it is and the river comes up and it's too contentious for that fish, they'll move upstream. They typically don't go downstream. But they'll go upstream and they'll move close to the shore, get out of the current, and, and, and study the river when you're watching. And you know this, Trevor, you know this. It's still probably a little trick question. But you know that when the river's moving, you can look up and down the river and you can see areas where that current is turning back around on itself and creating a little eddy. When it does that, the current's really slow, the fish don't have to expend a lot of energy, and that's where they're going to be. Jim Allen says, fish supplier said to add some koi to the lake, but the state said that's a terrible idea. And he thought, absolutely, that's a terrible idea. Koi might be cheap, but they're carp. You know, and if any of them survive, they're going to reproduce, and then you're going to have carp, and you're just trading problems. So koi doesn't make any sense. What makes the most sense is to try to manage the predator-prey relationships uh, that you have. If the, if the uh, gizzard shad are in fact overcrowded, their life cycle, their, their life span is only 18 months to three years anyway. So it's not hard to get ahead of them, but you kind of got to get that predator number up high enough that they can overcome the shad. When the shad are here and your predator numbers are here, you got to get it like this. Once you get it like that, where you have enough big bass that are predators on gizzard shad to interfere with the survival rates of their reproduction, that's when you get ahead of gizzard shad. Another way to get ahead of gizzard shad is to have a harsh freeze because when they're about two years old and they're distressed, it's easier for them to die when the water temperature plummets. And that's nature's way of handling it. Okay, um, check into tiger muskies. Get a few opinions on that. I think that could be a good choice. I didn't think about that when we were talking, but that could be a good choice. There are only six natural lakes in Kentucky. That's pretty cool. There's only one in Texas. Billy Miller, my wife's ducks finally found the Texas Hunter feeder. So I had to switch it to nighttime feedings. It's set for three feedings, 10, 2, and 4.30. But I noticed my battery and solar kit isn't keeping up with the night feedings and dies. I think it's just the battery going bad. Yes, that's what it would be. That's exactly what it would be. So switch the battery. And uh, even just because it's going off at night doesn't mean the battery can't keep it charged. So I would say that's probably a battery going bad. Dave Weber, so tell us why you would not put any flatheads in the 80 acre lake. Too many shad? No, because when you put the when you put those flathead minnows in it, I mean a flathead catfish in an 80 acre lake, you know, now if you could look at those, now Dave Weber, you're gonna slap me right across the phone, but I'm not trying to be cute. Yeah, maybe I am. You can look at that flathead, hold him up and say, now listen, only eat gizzard shad. He's going to laugh at you. If you put a 20-pound flathead catfish in an 80-acre lake and it sees a 3-pound bass, it's going to eat it. So it's not like they're going to be selective about what they're going to eat. They are, they are dominant predators. They dominate their territory. They want a territory. Going back to that 2-acre lake with 1,000 pounds of flatheads, there'll be about 5 of those flatheads that make it out of that whole batch. And they're going to weigh, after it's all said and done, you're going to have a total of 100 to 150 pounds of flathead catfish. They're all going to be 50 pounds apiece. They're going to wipe out the rest of the flatheads. And there may be 10 flatheads. There'll be 3 to 10 flatheads after this is all done. They will eat the majority of those channel catfish. And you're going to end up with just those few fish. So, going back to, the, going back to Mr. Welsh, you better be eating some of those fish. So, anyway, that's my take. So, uh, Dave, to answer your question, is they're just, they're, they're not selective. They're going to eat whatever they can eat. There are some flatheads. They netted two 35-pounders last year, but they eat everything. That's right, including the $12 a piece bass, which just went up to 15 bucks, by the way. <coughs> Millie Miller's got three tiger muskies. Came from Harrison Fish Farms in Missouri. They're awesome. In a four-and-a-half-acre pond, they're caught almost weekly, growing like crazy. They help call my small bass and are plain fun to catch. Bingo, that's it. That's it. J.P. Clayton is going to be floating down the Brazos on Sunday. Well, you know what? That river's perfect for floating right now. It's right over here. I can almost see it from here. They're letting. Uh, last time I looked, they're letting out 10,000 cubic feet per second. 
that's a pretty good amount. You can float pretty fast on that, so you're going to have to slow down. Um, Trevor, Santee Cooper. Okay, is there only one natural lake in Texas? Yes, that's Caddo Lake. That's it. Trevor got it. Caddo Lake's the only natural lake in Texas. Hey, let's pause for a minute, do a little commercial. You guys know that I appreciate our sponsors, Karina Mills. Um, yeah, there's a story in the next uh, issue of Pond Box coming up, July, August. I was late getting into the printer, so it's late in the mailbox. It's probably going in the mail about right now, so my apologies to that. Actually, if I was working for Pond Boss, I would fire myself for being so late. But there's a story in there about Purina Mills Lake. Uh, we started talking like back in 2016 about things they could do with that lake if they'd renovate it. Well, they renovated it. We went and shocked it, electrofished it back in uh, April or May. I guess it was May. And we've chronicled that renovation and talked to you about that and talking about how the fish are doing as well. So, subscribe to Palm Boss, folks. Here's your commercial. 35 bucks a year. I know Josie's on here with Wayne. You guys hold hands and say it together. This is their Wednesday night date night watching this show. I love, I love you guys. Um, 35 bucks a night, a, a year, cheaper than a Friday night date. Last all year, and the date's gone. Date's gone the next day. So, you guys do that. Charlie Kaplinger, first time. Good to see you, man. We love first timers. Hope you get hooked, so to speak. Um, also, thanks to Texas Hunter Products for helping sponsor this show. Purina sponsors the show. Uh, Greg Grimes, Aquatic Environmental Services. David Schneiderman, you saw him earlier. Scroll back up. Befriend him here. Uh, Easy Docks of Texas, although he ships all over the nation. So if you're looking for a floating dock, David Schneiderman is a good candidate for that. So check it out. All right, guys. Let me, let's me let see. Uh, throw me some questions out here. I'm going to scroll back here. Um, Let's see, Wyatt, new issue. I still don't have the last month. So Wyatt, call the office tomorrow. Talk to Leanne. Uh, honestly, because we've really had some trouble with the Postal Service. You know, after the elections last year, our, our, the magazines mailed from Georgia. How many issues did they have last year with mail-in ballots or mail-in pawn boss? We've got people that still aren't getting their magazines, and we sent them. But if you didn't get yours... Call the office tomorrow, 903-564-6144, and talk to Leanne, and she'll get one going for you. Here's Justin Shank checking in from the left coast. Dave Weber, no offense, just find tonight's show very interesting. I have a northwest Missouri friend who put a large flathead in his six-acre, five-year-old pond, trying desperately to remove it. He's convinced it's really hurting his largemouth bass population. Yeah, totally, dude. Yeah, I get that. That's why I wasn't really picking on Tommy, but I kind of was. You know, before I spent um, $6,000 on catfish to put into a two-acre pond, I think I'd have done a little more due diligence. However, I can understand that. I can. I get it. Because you don't know what you don't know. You know, so we'll talk about that a little bit because that's pretty expensive food chain. Okay. Bluegill Maniacs on Open Lake. Table Rock specifically. I'm pretty good at finding bluegills, but the red ear elude me. Guys who don't catch, guys who catch don't share information. How do they differ in locating them? I'll tell you exactly how they differ. Bluegill maniacs on Table Rock Lake, if you can catch bluegills. Red ear live in plants. Red ear make their living eating snails. That's their deal. That's their mission. Look at those gigantic red ears that are caught over there in Lake Havasu and along the Colorado River in Arizona. Or any quagga mussels. So red ears feed on crustaceans, uh, things that are, have a shell. So red ear feed on that. And so where most of those things live are in aquatic plants. So that's why you're going to find red ear in plants. So if you can go find some pond weed over at Table Rock, you're going to be more likely to find red ear sunfish. Now they're also around rocks. Anywhere that snails live, red ear sunfish will live if they become established in that lake. Mike Bruderly, my two acre pond in northeast Ohio was just finished last summer. Blue go spawn like crazy and pea gravel in June, but all I'm seeing is perch and bass fry. Are the bluegill fry just too small to see? They are for a little while. And then what they do when they come off the nest, the uh, your perch and bass fry are predators. So those baby bluegills, they like to scoot 
They got to go get somewhere. They, well, they want to be in plants, dense cover, algae, in the crevices between rocks, or they got eaten. So if you're not seeing them, they could have been eaten. But they can't. They are too small to see for a little while. A little while meaning two weeks after they hatch. So if it's been two weeks since you've seen them, they've either vacated the premises and gone for cover, or they've been eaten. So here we go. Any more questions? I'm going to scroll back here for a minute and see if there's any more uh, questions that I missed. Like last week, I missed my good friend Randy Smith's question about what kind of fish to put in a spa. Well, his wife and my wife have known each other since they were two years old in the church nursery. So uh, I kind of threw a little poke back at Randy. I called him after the show was over. But here we go. Um, Okay, I'm not seeing any more comments. Okay, let's see here. James, 4-inch gill net seems to do well for moving flatheads. They will break the net, so expect that. That's absolutely right. You know, 4-inch gill net will catch flatheads. It will allow most bass to go through. It will allow all bluegills to go through. 4 inches, about so big. It's going to allow most of the fish to go through. And when you get that flathead, it's going to tear up the net. Trevor says, have you found that green sunfish are a problem for a pond? I've seen them take over a pond, so I typically try to remove them. You know, Trevor, I used to think green sunfish were an issue, but now I just think they're a little bit of a nuisance. They only spawn once a year. Bluegills spawn oh, three to five, depending on where you are. Where you are in Somerville County, they're going to spawn four times a year, maybe five. So we consider bluegill the backbone of the food chain for largemouth bass. Now, in a river system, like you and I were talking about today, here. Uh, bluegill are a little bit different. They suit a different niche, but in a pond, they're the backbone of the food chain for largemouth bass. <coughs> um, green sunfish spawn once a year. Now, what I've seen is bluegill can spawn so many times through the course of a year that just strictly through attrition, they can outcompete green sunfish within about two and a half or three years. So if you got a bass bluegill pond, there's a handful of green sunfish in there, they're not that big a deal. They're not really a problem. So, but if you catch one, throw it out, eat it, you know, use it for bait to try to catch a big bass in the river. <laughs> All right, so going back to Jim Allen uh, there in the lake in Louisville, Kentucky, you know, to, to, to remove the gizzard shad, I would be looking at a kind of a three-prong approach. Keep doing what you're doing. You need more bass that are, that are, that are conditioned to be predators. Now, 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 they're naturally born predators, but when they've been conditioned to eat fish food, they don't really know how to be predators. They become dependent on that fish food. So they've got to go out and chase a few small fish before they can finally figure out they can go ch chase and catch a bigger fish. So one way is to, instead of buying feed train bass, see if you can find a supplier that's going to sell you bigger bass that are, that are not feed trained. Now another thing to do is to uh, have the lake surveyed at least every other year just to see what kind of impact your stockings are having. In theory, you should be able to grow up enough bass that hatch every year that they can that they can uh, begin to manage those gizzard shad for you. In about every three or four years, you have a strong enough winter that's going to take out enough shad that the bass should be able to catch up with them. The third thing is, is if it's not happening fast enough for you, look at doing a personal rope known kill but you're gonna spend some dollars on that. You're looking at five figures. Low five figures, but still five figures. Okay, we got a few more questions here. Let me see here. Let's see, Tracy. Dave Weber, eight and a half acre, 40 plus year old watershed pond, Northwest Missouri. Bad siltation problem, good crappie and bass fishery watershed district. Talking about dredging the pond. When's the best time of year in this area for dredging due to the least amount of damage? Uh oh, I scrolled past it. Hang on a minute. Let me go back to the fishery. Winter. Do it before ice up. That's the best time. If you're truly going to dredge it, do it in the winter time. What dredging means to me is you get a dredge in there. The churns up the silt, you're going to spit it down, spit it out, and let the, the uh, silt, leave the silt out, let the water run back in the pond. 
Now, if you were going to try to drain it and then get heavy equipment in it, then I'd say do that in the uh, late fall, uh, way before ice up. You know, and, and you, if you, you need to talk to who's going to do it because weather can certainly affect the outcome based on the equipment that you choose to use. That'll get me out of trouble with Drew Hay and Michael Gray and Mike Cotto. <laughs> if you're going to truly use a dredge, I'd look at doing that in the wintertime right before ice up. That's when the fish are sluggish, the water's cold, you can uh, churn up and get rid of a bunch of the, of the silt and the water still has time to settle back out before ice up. Robert Dyer, would you say green sun, sunfish are a greater problem for northern climate ponds than southern climate ponds? As a result, the bluegill not spawning as many times a year in the north as they do in the south. No, I wouldn't. I would say that green sunfish are probably less of a problem in the north because they're going to enhance your fishery. They're going to diversify your food chain because they're going to spawn at a different time than the bluegill. Now, here's the catch-22. Green sunfish have a slightly bigger mouth than bluegill, so they compete in the food chain differently than a bluegill does. They're a little bit more aggressive, and with a bigger mouth, they can eat bigger food pieces than a bluegill can. So I'm going to I'm going to tell you it's kind of a balancing act there. I would say green sunfish are probably a greater problem in southern climate ponds than they are in northern climate ponds for different reasons. For different reasons. I think I think that in northern ponds they would actually enhance the fishery more than they would in a southern pond. That's just my opinion. And I just jerked that right out of the sky just cuz I've never really thought about that. What can cause pond water to have a muddy tint long after the mud and dirt would have settled in a clear water bottle? Um, there's all kinds of things that can dissolve into water. Um, you know, there's, there is colloidal clay that doesn't necessarily dissolve, but it's magnetically clinging to a water molecule. And they're so small they can give it kind of a tint to the water. There's also tannins. So if you were to take like a, an oak tree leaf, let it turn brown, let it steep in the water, it's going to give off tannins they are going to give the water a, a, a brown tint. So there's things that water absorbs or things that dissolve in the water that alter the uh, color as well. Justin, what's the difference between spotted bass and largemouth bass from a pond's perspective? Well. Spotted bass in a pond, they don't reproduce the same as largemouth do, and they don't get nearly as big. So, and it was really funny because most hatcheries don't supply spotted bass, but they do supply largemouth bass simply because largemouth bass get bigger. Now, I've, I've come across a number of lakes in my career that have spotted bass, and they live in a totally different niche. We'll be electrofishing, for example. There's a lake in North Texas. Uh, Lake Kiowa. The first time I ever saw a spotted bass in a private lake, this is a 570 acre lake. And we were shocking up in the coves, largemouth bass. But boy, the minute we hit the dam and there's riprap, we caught probably 50 spotted bass in an area no bigger than a football field. So they have a little different habitat requirements than largemouth do. So they occupy a different niche, they have a tiny bit different food chain, their growth rates are different. Their ultimate size is different. Their behavior is different. So there's the differences, but in a pond, I think largemouth bass are better to have. James says, just notice my supplier sells freshwater lobsters. Other than your hot tub, is that a cash crop for a lake? If you could harvest those freshwater lobsters, which are probably Macrobrachium rosenbergi, which are freshwater prawns, and I've stocked those in ponds to, to use as, an, as a, a value-added forage. The problem is, yeah, they could be a cash crop if you could get them out. That's the problem. And they're going to die, if it's, if it's the animal I'm thinking of, they're going to die when the water temperature hits about 55, 56, 57. Okay, Betty Jean Cross, new follower from Panfish Nation. Good to see you there, Betty Jean. Welcome. Glad you're... Uh, hanging out with us tonight. Dredging equipment needs to use vegetable oil in its hydraulic system, right? I think if I was going to have an oil spill, I'd rather it be vegetable oil. 
Stephen Martin, how about Warmouth? They bad for half acre pond? You know, Stephen, Warmouth are, um, they like slow moving water, creeks, um, backwaters. They're not prolific reproducers. And, it, and I come across them from time to time in small ponds. And I'm okay with them because they're not overwhelming. They don't come in and disrupt the ecology of the pond. So, I'm going to tell you, no, they're not bad. When you catch one, you're going to catch one. And it's going to be fun. It's going to be maybe as big as your hand. And you're going to catch it and say, whoa, I caught a warm out. Cool. You're going to throw it back. And it's going to be irrelevant to the rest of that pond. Red Bowls. First time viewer. Good to see you, man. Thoughts on crappie in a pond? Is there a minimum acreage? Would you suggest stocking only black crappie? Well, here's my, here's my spin on that, Brad. Um, I don't really like crappie in water smaller than about 20 acres. Now, there's Chico checking in. Hey, late howdy from Mike Garcia, my dear friend from down in Seguin, America. Good to see Chico. So, Brad, here's what I'm going to tell you about that. Um, crappie are, are top-line predators limited by their mouth size. There's several things about crappie that give them an advantage that gives you a disadvantage. So here's the way I'm going to explain this. They are top-end predators limited by the smallness of their mouth. They're inconsistent spawners. You can't predict if they're going to spawn next year or this year or last year. They're the first fish to spawn in warm water ponds. And if you got yellow perch or northern pike or fish like that, cold water fish, those fish are going to spawn first. But in warm water ponds, crappie spawn first. Their babies are coming off the beds feeding on the babies of the other fish they're going to hatch. So, to that end, I like to see ponds at least 20 acres or bigger for crappie. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you don't stock crappie. I've heard enough stories from folks that have a, a one-acre pond where they stocked hybrid strippers and crappie and hybrid sunfish and did fine. But I do know that at some point in that pond's life, the crappie are going to tend to overpopulate. And when that happens, you're going to have to fix it. So, that's the way I see it. All right, folks, it's about 7.25 right at it. So I'm getting ready to kind of wrap it up. Debbie's ready to go to the 19th hole, have a little late supper with our new neighbors that we just met here a couple weeks ago. So I'm going to start wrapping it up. Um, hey, be sure and tune in next week. I'm so excited. Going to hang out with Miss America 1975, her husband. I can't wait to meet the guy that married Miss America. I think that's just cool as heck. Hang out with son, their son, John Barrett, who's an avid Palm Boss subscriber, Palm Boss follower, and a Pond Meister in his own right. He's got three young kids. He's trying to kind of set the stage so they can catch fish. And you know, Grandma and Grandpa want to be able to provide those grandkids with something fun to do. I'm going to get to hang out with some of my grandkids this weekend. we got another birthday party coming up. I don't know how many birthday parties we've been to, but it's been a lot. When you have 12 grandkids and they all have a birthday, you go to a lot of dance recitals, a lot of birthday parties, and it's pretty fun. So uh, I'm going to kind of wind it down. You guys be sure and tune in. Hey, and spread the news. Spread the news. We're going to have a very special show next Wednesday at the Barrett Ranch. Wit, Texas, on the pond bank. I think we're going to be in the pavilion. I don't know. I hope, hope we are. I want to be in the shade on a July day. <laughs> and then uh, you're going to get to meet Miss America 1975, her husband, son. Debbie's going to be there. You're going to have a bunch of questions, and we're going to go through a whole agenda on what they're wanting to do and how they're doing it. And it will be real-world pond management instead of a whole bunch of, hey, this is what you should do. It's going to be real world stuff. So, hey, listen, I really do appreciate you guys checking in, watching this show. Can't wait to see you next Wednesday night live from Barrett Ranch in Witt, Texas. So, until then, adios.